Yeah, so welcome everybody. So uh, now we are starting the second uh, quantum battle as part of this uh, virtual conference. Of course, we already had a very interesting quantum battle uh, yesterday. Now we have the second one uh, about quantum interference and in imaging. Uh, and in this uh, battle, we have five panelists, uh, Kasra Amini from Jens Wiegerts Group in Barcelona, Alexis Chacon from the Max Planck Research Initiative in Korea, Sebastian Eckert from Reiner Dörner's group in Frankfurt, Benjamin Fetich from the Milosevic groups, group in Sarajevo, and Matthias Kubo from the group of Gerhard Paulus uh, at the University of Jena. Uh, starting off this discussion, I would ask all of you panelists to very briefly introduce yourselves, a little bit your research field. So maybe starting with you at the top, Kasra. Hi there, um, I'm Kasra. Um, I'm a research fellow in Jens Wiegerts group. Um, I'm an experimentalist, so I'm interested in strong field physics, uh, particularly working with laser induced electron diffraction, uh, two electron holography, two long explosion imaging, um, and looking at uh, structural uh, determination and structural dynamics in molecules, gas phase molecules. Okay, thank you. Alexis? Okay, my name is Alexis Chacon, and I'm, I hold in a junior group leader positions at the Max Planck Institute of Korea, okay, hold it by the Professor Donald Kim, or the Director Donald Kim, so far. And my main interest in ultrafast science and ultrafast nonlinear spectroscopy nowadays are focuses in solids. But my history, previous histories, come from atomic and molecular physics, like double electron ionizations and single electron ionization, high harmonic generation from the several single or few particle systems. So that is the main topics which I am interested in on. And nowadays I'm just moving on to quantum materials or solid or condensed matter phases physics. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sebastian? Yes, hello. I'm also an experimentalist from, from Frankfurt and I'm uh, studying the strong field ionization in two color fields using cold rooms reaction microscopes. And my current interest lies in subcycle interference in two color fields that are um, similar to those rabbit experiments which we have so much uh, learned about today. Okay, thank you. And Benjamin? Hello, my name is Benjamin Fetich. I work in a, in a theoretical group of Professor Dan Milosevic at the University of Sarajevo. My main research field is development of new numerical methods used to simulate ionization experiment. Thank you. And finally, Matthias? Yeah, hello. Um, I am also an experimentalist. My research focuses on imaging and controlling the dynamics of um, atoms and molecules in strong fields, in particular using phase controlled laser pulses. And one thing I particularly like doing is the so-called Stier technique, where I combine a few cycle pulses in the visible with emit infrared pulses to make sort of a street camera. And that's uh, really useful for achieving these goals, imaging and controlling um, electron dynamics. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, okay, so now to get the discussion uh, going, uh, perhaps I should make a few introductory remarks. And, and one thing that I would like to point out is that the panelists that, that we have in front of us today, uh, they're not exactly seeing each other for the first time today, but, but in fact, I could say that today is the culmination of a, a longer process that they have uh, done together. They've had a lot of discussions in the last weeks, even the last months, I think, in preparation for this event. And, uh, and I think along the way, uh, as far as I could tell, I've seen the process a little bit uh, just in the last few days, uh, a very interesting dynamic has developed. I think initially they started off as two teams that were supposed to battle each other. Uh, but uh, in essence, I think in, in the last uh, weeks or so, uh, they've developed into a kind of think tank and a kind of think tank that's, that's been producing uh, some very, very interesting ideas. And, and uh, some of them quite provocative, some of them quite controversial. Uh, and in that sense, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the way that they will discuss uh, these ideas among themselves uh, within this discussion, and also the way that they will discuss them with you as an audience. There will be several points within this discussion where we will involve you as an audience. We will ask you questions. We will ask you to express an opinion. And then depending on what you respond, we may also want to contact you to, to involve you in the discussion. Um, what you see on the, on the leading slide here are some of the uh, statements, some of the positions that uh, the panel has come up with. Uh, interference is a mathematical trick. It's not real. Um, 
how are LID and holography useful for molecular structure? Why should we do experiments? Can't we calculate it all with, uh, with TDSC? Or on the contrary, we should never calculate TDSC, just do an experiment. And finally, also decoherence. It's just a symptom of not really doing your experiment properly. So quite provocative statements. And uh, I'm very, very curious to see how the panel will discu discuss these points and, and what, they, uh, what they will uh, present to you this afternoon. So uh, without further ado, I think, uh, Benjamin, you will kick uh, the presentation off that you guys That's have. right. OK. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Racking for, for the introduction. So we start today battle with a simple question. What is interference? Is it a mathematical trick? Can we measure interference and what physical information we can uh, extract from interference? So next slide, please. So uh, we typically, when we do ionization experiment, uh, we measure photoelectron spectrum. So the uh, electron, which is bound, absorbs photon from the from the laser field. And can you can you show the plot, please, Kasra? So what uh, what we get is typical ATI peaks. And these peaks can be uh, described by using simple uh, photonic picture, meaning that, uh, meaning the position of these peaks are determined by the number of photons absorbed by the electron. So uh, is this enough? So the question is, is this enough? Do we need another picture in order to describe the, this uh, interference patterns that we see in a photoelectron spectrum? Uh, the question uh, should be answered and uh, in the following slides. Well, uh, before I actually answer any question, I'd like to throw sort of a steep hypothesis out there, out there. Namely, we don't actually need interference. Interference is actually uh, a term that people use when they haven't been able to identify the conserved quantity of a uh, a certain system that they're studying, like as we've seen for both ATI and HHG, uh, the peak structure is a consequence of energy conservation and the photons in the field. So uh, let me give you another example. And I, I'm going to use the double slit since this is sort of the most favorite thing of all the interference people. So as we know, this equation here describes uh, the angular positions of the interference maxima of a double slit. So I'm going to say like this is actually a, a, a signature of the double slit retron. That's the conserved quantity of the double slit. And it has the value lambda over D. But Matthias, here they want to have some kind of interruption and then sorry. I don't quite, I don't quite understand why interference is a mathematical trick in quantum mechanics. In particular, I mean in ultra-fast processes, because first of all, you were talking about conserved quantities, okay? And then I wouldn't say if in the system itself is conserved if you don't consider the whole systems uh, by means of the laser matter response and the response of the laser to the matters, okay? In that sense, for the Hamiltonian of the system, we can say that it commute in time at every time. And if a quantity doesn't commute at every time with a, that itself Hamiltonian, I would say that this quantity is not conserved. How you can contract you uh, with respect to that one? Um, well, it's a steep hypothesis. I'm not entirely sure about this either. Let's try to find out. Sebastian, okay. what do you have to say about this? Y yes, I think the question is what is conserved during uh, the, the double slit. And just uh, one remark, maybe it's angular momentum. So there was, would be one other option one could consider. But I just want to introduce now a completely different perspective to uh, to oppose the view by Matthias, which you just, just presented. So here we look at a, a circularly polarized laser field. So Kazra, can you maybe just click once? And it's the, the electric field vector, vector, which evolves in the polarization plane. And now we add just a weak second harmonic field to it. And then this, the second harmonic field is counter rotating and one gets one of these nice propeller like fields. And now we study um, tunnel ionization or strong field ionization for such a field. And to this end, one can solve, for example, the time dependent Schrodinger equation. This was here done for the intensities um, shown here on the bottom of the slide. And the 2DT, 2D TDS E code was, uh, is based on a code by Uwe Tum. And the resulting electron momentum distribution then shows here clearly this uh, threefold structure, which is just due to the nonlinear nature of tunneling. 
And in addition, one can nicely see those ATI rings here um, in the in momentum space. That's the um, yeah, momentum distribution in polarization plane. Yeah, it's, it's what one expects, absolutely. So that's the energy quantization yeah. picture here on the left-hand side. But now the TDSE is it's a time-dependent theory. And now we can look at, could you just click with the mouse, not on the video, because there's another animation coming in. So just go, yeah, yeah. and now just click a right arrow, so to say. Yes, and now we, we swipe through time and we see um, that's a grid and position space. Um, and now at the laser pulses, is this the uh, electric field of the laser pulse? And now part of the wave function is here emitted into free space. So here's one um, wave packet of the three, here's the other wave packet as the, as the three, and here's the third wave packet in, within one cycle. And now if the second cycle uh, is released from the atom then we start to see interferences even in position space. And that's a really nice picture that we can yes. see the birth of ATI peaks in the time domain, just looking at position space. And we have put no photons or conserved quantities in. It's all just comes from the TDSC or from solving the TDSC. Yeah, that's great. That looks fantastic. Yes, it now is my tune. And then the full, I had a slightly more particle, let's say more particle, not let's say more dual, persons in the sense of I uh, more concerned about the wave pictures of the quantum mechanics. And here I will try to focus my statement in terms of the direct AT and with the fastest least analogy. I mean, to, as a source of contra arguments uh, between upper commas against um, Matthias. And here they will say that I have five propositions. The first propositions that they have is the ground states is the electron source for the wave for the electron wave packets as you see clearly i don't know if i can point it out with my row here and here we see the positions as a function of the time of the electronic density okay driven by this circular sorry circular linear polarized laser field that we have here in violet lines and what we see is in the strong ionization channels at every half a cycle of the laser fields around the maximum. But this doesn't mean that around the series of laser field, you cannot have some probability of some events. So let's continue with the second statement that I have here or propositions with this um, read in terms of the ground state or the laser ground state interaction can create multiple times a space light, what I name it S1, S2, and Sn. Let's say this narrow that we have here on these boxes, the clear the node is located around the zero of the laser field. The source statement is related with the localizations of that, um, let's say it's a slit, it's that the slit that localizes around zero, as we also already mentioned. And my fourth statement is the bisymmetric arguments, this is slits, are separated by the cycle of the laser field, as here you can clearly see in that, in that kind of statements. And by symmetric argument here, I say that the electron can go for positive deep, uh, positions and the electron can go for the negative position. I would say positive position in that direction, I would say negative position in that direction with positive velocity. <laughs> So let's focus in what we can measure. What we can measure in the lab, as it was shown in the previous slides, is the final momentum distribution of the finite um, photoelectron spectra. And here we see in that vertical axis, let me put it here, in that vertical axis, the photon and the energy of the photoelectron spectra as a function of the infrared photons, okay? And as a function also as a, a count or, or the yields for the photoelectron emitted. What I wanted to focus with my simple model, or let's say with my toy model of uh, multiple slits or ultra fast multiple slits, is that each peak is, or let's say two consecutive peaks in ATI, I separate are separately by one photon of the infrared laser pulses. And here we can distinguish from the photon Alexis, axis. If I may comment. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Go ahead. Real, oh, so the real question is can you measure this probability density? What probability density you are talking so you, about? So you have a position in time. So this is a probability oh. density. 
you're showing i don't think so what you are what you are here i can mention is the final momentum uh, distributions let's say is at the, the final time here i can show you but um, what can you say about this probability density you are showing this you, uh, as an argument for you point of view I'm saying this is an argument of point of view because I just want to have a simple picture in terms of I can explain that kind of difference in the energy spectra. And it is simple. Is I can explain this in terms of that a slit experiment is mean that has something to do with the realities. Is I cannot explain it, this has nothing to do. And then I know I don't set any argument to be right with this kind of statement that they put in here. This kind of statement can be absolutely wrong, and that I don't have anything to do again that. But it is this is right, as I showed in the previous slide, that when you go, I mean I, the, the previous slide was delaying because of things of times. When you get the squared of this quantity here of S1 and S2, you can end up with a conditions which satisfies um, the maximum interference of two different waves. Okay, and it is of two or from two different slides. And this maximum interference, two different slides are exactly separated but one photon of the energy. The four, I cannot say that this method is wrong. Uh, I say, can say that this method is wrong in terms of absolutely um, position of the peaks, but I cannot say it's wrong in terms of two consecutive, that the distance between cons two consecutive peaks. I would say that this is right in terms of the experimental observations. So I don't know if this satisfies your questions, but I am absolutely sure that we cannot go okay. Inside the, of that the, momentum the position distribution. Sorry. So the but, the best possible answer would be that this uh, interference in time domain is consistent with a photonic picture that we saw earlier. Yes, it's consistent. I mean, this electron wave packet, or wave pictures, or the slide, what I call it here, direct ATI, ultra-fast split analogies, is consistent with the photon picture. Well, this is what my main point it is in the slides. That the conclusion that we can say from that observation is that you can explain the different energy between each consecutive peaks of the ATI in terms of some kind of wave pictures in terms of in, or some kind of ultra-fast split analogy as already I call it. So, um, I think, I don't know if you agree or disagree, but I also, relatively speaking, agree with you because if I'm trying to see what happens in these slides, let's say in this slide, a slide and also in this slide, sorry, um, I'm completely sure you will banish the kind of observations because simply you are trying to see that is light, and according to Richard Feynman lectures, is you try to see what where the electron goes through every slide, you will just go to the classical pictures, and that's all. So I think with this, I gave the opportunity to the next speaker, which is yeah, Matthias. Uh, I think you also Matthias. wanted to say something about uh, yeah, you, in ATI. Huh? Yeah, just yeah. really quick. So we've uh, we have now seen two opposing views how you can explain ATI. That's uh, very nice. Uh, we know that the photoelectron spectrum uh, consists of even more features that might be in, um, well associated with interference. So how about those other types? Yes, yeah, so this is where I would like to first say a few words about the types of electron trajectories you actually have um, within a sub-cycle. So here you have a field-free um, Coulombic potential. Um, if we now, place this uh, Coulomb potential in a field, you perturb it. Um, and let's say we have basically now a detector plane, let's say on the right hand of the Coulomb potential, what you can do is you can release an electron called a direct electron that flies straight away, away from the actual um, atomic core. Here we visualize a P uh, orbital of argon, and it's just visualized as so uh, in the red. You can also have um, an electron that can be emitted and because of the oscillating field, uh, electric field of the laser, it can then return the electron and it can backscatter. So this is how backscattering looks like, comes back and then it backscatters away. 
towards the same detector plane. And this, I would like to say, let's say is at T0, where it's the first peak maximum. If we go to the next half cycle, we now perturb the field uh, on the left-hand side. And what can happen is, again, we can have a direct electron that can go away from the detector plane, or we can have an electron that can, again, be um, returned by the oscillating laser field. And now it can forward scatter. Um, towards the same detector plane as before, and this is how forward scattering looks like. So if you amalgamate both together um, and have this detected in your detector, what you have are these three trajectories. And typically forward scattering direct electron uh, are measured in the low energy range and backscattered electrons are measured in the very high um, uh, electron kinetic energy. And each of these actually has uh, something called a short and long trajectory, as you seen earlier, and this really depends on where they are, the electrons are born in, in the field. Okay, well, thanks, Katra, for this nice overview of all these different types of trajectories. And this is the basis for the, all the different types of, let's call them interferences that we have. So we've heard about ATI, here, uh, the emission times are spaced by a full cycle, which gives rise to this pattern. But then we also have interferences between direct electrons and forward scattered electrons. This is um, what is sometimes called the temporal double slit or intracycle interferences. And that's the pattern down here that we would observe, expect from those um, situations. We, we can, however, also have different types of uh, scattered trajectories interfering, and they give rise to an interference pattern in space. Uh, this is uh, called photoelectron holography, where one of the trajectories actually misses the detector. So this is sort of our reference signal. Uh, sorry, it doesn't miss the detector, it misses the atom when it uh, returns. And then we have another one that actually scatters. So this is sort of like um, a spherical wave. And then these two can overlap and that's the picture that gives us uh, this photoelectron holography and these stripes here. So can we understand those in a quantization picture as well? Yes, and before we come to, uh, before we can answer this question, I want to generalize the idea of subcycle interference a bit further and uh, also look at cases where there is no recollision. And to this uh, purpose, so could you just click one? Mm -hmm. Um, we look at a two color laser field again. So now the two colors are co-rotating in the plane of polarization and the second harmonic is much more intense than the fundamental wavelength. And in this scenario, they are, for each angle in the polarization plane, there are exactly two um, possible values of the laser electric field. And um, this then leads to a two path interference to finer momentum space and the electron momentum distribution then looks like this, where we have the ATI peaks expected for the second harmonic. And in between um, those peaks in the energy domain, one can see sidebands that they are nicely separated in momentum space. And if one uses a really simple um, semi-classical theory, which is, which is ba basically a simplification of the theory by shretzov shilovsky the SCTS model, um, yeah, can just click one, one further. Um, we just look at uh, electron trajectories that are spaced exactly one light cycle. And for this case, then we look at interference pattern and we see in final momentum space clearly just rings, just click once. Um, yeah, just rings which are perfectly spaced by the photon energy. So it's just momentum space here. And that's why they're not equidistant, but in, in energy space, they have just the same spacing. But if we now look at a different scenario, now we can look at intracycle interference. So just click once again. So intracycle interference where the two electrons emerge within one cycle, and then we calculate the interference pattern with a, with a semi-classical theory. Then um, we see a different interference pattern. Um, so just click, and this interference pattern now is, is, is it's not clearly defined in energy, but it depends on the angle in the polarization plane. So those, those circles here are distorted, which can be easily seen as looking as those um, black lines to guide the eye here. Um, and uh, that's a really fundamental process because of the subcycle interference. And the subcycle interference is really useful because it can be used um, 
So now comes a little advertisement part, but later on we will derive an interesting poll from it. So um, one can use a subsec interference to retrieve the complex valued electron continuum wave function and uh, even position offsets of the electron wave packet at the tunnel exit and also the Wigner time delay in the molecular frame. So it's a really useful property that those um, sub mm -hmm. interference exist. But now the question is, can they, can they be related to any um, conser conserved quantity in the system? So ATI peaks are related to um, the photon energy, but intracycle True interference. Photon. So now this, that's the, yeah, the, the, that's the poll now. And the, the point is that intracycle interference cannot be modeled by photons. It's just an argument for now for the discussion because the time scale needed to explain intracycle interference is below the cycle of the, of the light field. And so the concept of a photon does not exist on subcycle time scales. And this could also indicate maybe that the wave particle duality is, is nonsense on subcycle time scales to be provocative. And now we have the yeah, So maybe if I can step in here. So uh, this is where you as audience are invited to uh, give an answer to the poll that hopefully has shown up on the screen. So please take a few seconds to, uh, to think about this and then give us your answer. Uh, in the meantime, I also have a question to the panel. Uh, <clears throat> that's a question that uh, has come in while you guys were uh, discussing about the photon and the wave picture in, in the context of ATI. Uh, Reiner Derner is asking uh, how to understand the UP shift that occurs in ATI from a photon picture uh, that doesn't include any fields. Uh, so would somebody from the panel like to answer that question? Um, Can yeah, you understand so the UP shift without uh, uh, within, a, within a photon picture? Well, um, so the, the typical way this is understood is that the UP shift is a Stark shift of the continuum, which of course the Stark shift is a consequence of the electric field that acts on the, the electrons. So in a pure photon picture, I have to admit, I don't know, but I never said that fields were not real. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would say that this comes from S matrix theory, this kind of energy conservation relationships. And also Maciek Lewins is demonstrated something in his famous paper of the rings, um, that when you create, when you have maximum peaks, these peaks have to appear in that kind of kinetic energy joint in the second or first slide by Benjamins. Um, I would say that it's coming naturally from the, from the consideration of the semi-classical pictures. And the semi-classical picture in the sense that we minimize the actions, not in the sense that we don't quantize an electromagnetic field because it would like to be really clear in that sense. Yeah, there there's some. actually this interesting comment coming in from uh, Emilio Pisanti, uh, which if it's possible, I would ask him to uh, express himself. So is it possible that sure. uh, Emilio is, uh, he's, I think he's already online. Yeah, so the, the, this is a response to the poll question. You ask whether the photons are real and photons are real. They are real in quantum optics. They are real in uh, quantum electrodynamics. But unless we're doing that, unless we're quantizing the fields, they are not. They're, 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 unless we include those aspects of the description, they are fake. That's what we all do. They are uh, uh, they are a representation of time domain physics. But uh, I, I don't think that's that's a helpful way to look at it. So, so just okay. To... okay. Thank you very much. Would somebody like to respond to this? And just to make sure, it was it the answer was um, photons um, are just a good concept, but are just a, so to say a boiled down concept to to easier describe time dependent time de the time dependent world as it is. Or and what was also the point? Basically, yes. Point, yeah. yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I I, I would agree. Yes. Okay, so maybe this is a nice uh, time then to look at the outcome of the poll, if this can be announced. Do, do we have a result for the poll? Oh, that's very interesting. It seems that we have a quite spread opinion. So some people uh, that express uh, photons do not exist at all. <coughs> and then almost an even split on the other, uh, on the other answers. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, would somebody within the panel like to respond to this? Yeah, maybe I can say something. I think uh, Reinhardt makes a very good uh, point about if you have a ponderometer shift, you must have a field present, right? Because if you've got a free electron oscillate uh, in, a, in, a, in an oscillating field, it must have a ponderometer shift. I think both are conceptually equally valid uh, pictures, both the photon picture and the field picture. 
but it's a really nice result what uh, Sebastian shows. I mean, uh, in terms of what interference can actually, uh, what role it can play in terms of ATI. Because typically people think of ATI in the photon picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and finally, is there somebody from within the audience who would like to comment on the outcome of this poll? Give the opportunity to perhaps one person if, if somebody has something very urgent that they would like to say. Uh, no, it doesn't seem to be the case. Then I suggest that we continue with the discussion and with the, with the next uh, item that you guys wanted to uh, discuss. Uh, so Alexis, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So, so far in this battle, we have talked about the quantum interference from a strong, a strong infrared emit, emit infrared laser field pulses, right? Um, but what about at the second of, let's say, quantum interference from at the second electron wave packet created by the XUB? Can you cast, click a little bit? Here, when we have an XUB, you know, interacting with certain atoms, everyone knows in the audience that the XUB photon energy must be larger than the most of the ionization potential of the systems that we know so far in nature. So this means the photoelectric effects will take place around and the electron can be ionized from this kind of P states and can be kicked out into the continuum and go into the detectors, right? In people into the detector, what we measure in the experiments that are such as such a detector that velocity map imagine and so on, that the experimentalists here in this panel know better than I, are just described by this math that's uh, absolutely squared of the probability to detect the, uh, the electrons in this scenario. Rather, roughly speaking, is we are talking about an S stays or a, a, S, yes, S states from the ground state, let's say it, we, we find something like that. So um, to the question here, to what I would have, I would say in terms of the key question is how we can be able to extract the phase of this electron wave packet if we lose that kind of phase, I would say it in the measuring processes. So, um, with the second statement that they would like to say, this is why we are interested in that phase. We are interested in that phase. Uh, sorry, one second. We are interested. Can we go back? We are interested in that phase because that phase is linked to the dipole matrix element phases. And that dipole matrix element phases contain direct information of the shape of the orbital in real space or either in momentum space, it doesn't matter the representations. You see, when I put very clearly this statement, that that is the reason why the electron wave packets are important, because through the knowledge of that phase, we can access to structural information, and also we can have some idea of dynamical information. Can we pass to the next slide, please? Uh, in this, and in this next slide, to answer the question or the key questions, how we can be able to extract that phase on the electron wave packets. Um, the most useful way is to think in terms of analogy, as the Richard Feynman said, try to see the world from another point of view. So in that sense, in the optical community of most of the people, one in the audience is to know that classical spiders in terms to measure the light, uh, let's say the, elect el the electric field and the amplitude and the phase of the electric fields and, and the electromagnetic wave. So what typically um, in a spider is done, I think here we have a typo. So is that we do is just split a single pulse in two different pulses, okay, into different lines as here you see, and add some kind of share or shift into the phase of one of the columns. Okay, here we have, three main ingredients. We have at the first pulses that we wanna fully characterize in amplitude and phase. The second one is we create uh, two pulses from the beginning by splitting it. And we add the phase shift to the end and a delay between both these pulses. And the third step is as we measure the final interference pattern to interferon pattern 
And therefore, we make a kind of Fourier analysis of these interprogram patterns, I would say, of this interprogram pattern that we have here and retrieve the phase by Fourier analysis. And the phase of what phase? The phase of the electrical fields oscillating, the oscillating electric fields. So um, the question is how we can apply this to electron wave packet or to second electron wave packet. As I said at the beginning, when we create an at the second electron wave packet by an XUB pulse, just what we measure in the lab is the kind of the amplitude squares of these momentum distributions. So if we move through the B panel in order to get the reality, or let's say the similarity to, to the spider technique, we need two copies of electron wave packet and then the electron wave packet with a kind of shift in its phase, let's say that kind of phase. So here we have a time delay between both laser, both XUB at the second poses, and I will point it out here, both XUB at the second poses, and here this is that weak infrared laser poses, and that weak infrared laser poses can create directly the shift dependent on where the XUB pulse is located with respect to the phase of the infrared laser pulse. In other words, if the XUB pulse is located around the maximums, I will have a shift of my wave packet, let's say in the negative directions, just because the final momentum distribution is determined by the negative of the vector potential. And this red line is the finest of the vector potential as here in this notation of the papers, Thomas Remitter was trying to uh, figure out. So, and the priority thing is that this, when we are around the series of this shift, you see no phase difference. Therefore, we need to go to any scenario in which each wave packet will be up and down to see a really phase difference and see if we can reduce that wave, uh, the phase of the electron wave packet in the continuum. So can we go to the next slide, please? So in the next slide, what I just want to summarize is what, what uh, Thomas Rimmitt is in the group was angular observed in that experiments. In the panel B or A, sorry, we have the experimental setup. In the experimental setup, we see clearly the infrared laser poles, but that train of photosecond pulses located either in the zero or either in the maximums as here we see in that panel B and panel C. And in panel, in the sub panel, let's say B, what we see is the interferon, interferon patterns generated by this train of attosecond pulses. This is train of attosecond pulses just located at the series of the vector potential. What we see is that this is more or less restricted to that very big circle, okay, but these interference in that direction is, are not well predominant as was predicted by theory. But on another hand, when we have the two, uh, or the say that the, the train of the second poses, um, relatively speaking, in the about the maxima, negative and the positive maxima, so the vector potential fields, what we see is totally different interference patterns of the wave packets created by the XUB at the second poses in presence of the infrared laser. So in the figure B and in this panel that I here I trying to show. Well, for us, the last summary of the very nice experiments. I'm sorry if I'm going to slow with that. And here, what we see is experimental results, the fringes, okay, and every point, maximas, minimas, and so on, and showing a very nice patterns on interferences. And here we see the total calculations from um, PX states or PYs of set. I don't remember exactly, but what we have is the superpositions of and it stays with uh, magnetic quantum number equal to zero and magnetic quantum number equal to plus one. So if they interpret that in the phase, the different phase would carry the information about that. But here the question is Alexis, zero. I think you have to speed up a little bit if you want to get to Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here we, I, I would like to speed a little bit in, in that part. Here the, still the question remains how we can extract the, the real information of the wave functions of the system. So in that V, can we go to the next slide? Um, Camilo, Manfred and I tried to make a nice proposition with respect to 
the previous one and extend that in such a way that we use two XUB at the second poses to create two electron wave packets, as here you can clearly see in that pictures, in presence of that infrared laser fields. And of course, measure the final momentum distribution and do the Fourier analysis to get the back the phase difference from the electron wave packets that we can see here. So can we go to the next slide? And then as you will finish to explain that. And then by applying that kind of real analysis that you already uh, uh, said, we can reconstruct and here we can see the amplitude of the electron wave packet in blue one compared to the exact calculations in violet one. We can see no difference between the exact ones and the reconstructed for negative momentums and for positive momentums. And as well, we get the dipole derivative of the phase that in this case, we were just expecting a Dirac delta, but a perfect Dirac delta from a numerical point of view is impossible. Just when one in integrate and make another analysis over the amplitude, we can get the amplitude of the dipole here, as I can want to show. And we can get also the sub phase that here can just denote that we can have not electron at that point, but let's say that delay is infinity, the photoelectron delay in photoemission for this uh, momentum of with uh, electron with that momentum about 1.5 is infinity. So no electron can be done and this was done by the, using this process. So with that in mind, I think it is my participation in, in that part. And now come Benjamin who is trying to explain how the Lee and the holography can be used here. And if you have any question in the audience, you can also be free to do it. Yeah, so please, Benjamin. Okay. Uh, let's see what we have here. So the question is, how, how do we extract information about the target, uh, whatever is a atomic or molecular target, uh, by, by measuring photoelectron spectra? So, uh, Laser induced electron diffraction is one of the methods how we 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 try to uh, extract this information, the uh, uh, structural information from the from the photoelectron uh, spectrum. So interference is a key point here. So we have a, a electron that can be scattered from one one atomic target in a molecule or the other. So there is essentially there are two different waves that interfere and, and they produce final momentum distribution. The same thing is with the holography. You have a one, one wave that goes direct to the uh, detector and the other uh, uh, electron wave go, uh, actually turns around uh, under, under the influence of the laser field and scatters uh, from the atomic center uh, from the atom atomic center. And these two waves interfere, producing some kind of interference factor in the final momentum, momentum distribution. So momentum distribution contains information about the uh, atomic uh, or molecular structure. The, the, key question, the key question here is, how do we extract that information? So maybe I can step in here. So here's a quantum picture basically of a P orbital um, argon. Um, mm -hmm. and the oscillating electric with a laser. And you can see the wave packet is starting to oscillate away. You have a string of wave packet that scatters elastically and it scatters again elastically, etc. Now you can either basically have um, after second emission of light or you can have elastic scattering of the um, emitted wave packet, which we can then um, detect on a detector. You can also have inelastic scattering, but here we'll focus on elastic scattering and also as uh, Benjamin mentioned, uh, interference between two trajectories. Um. Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks both of you. So as we have seen, holography and lead are really two sides of the same coin, namely a, a laser-driven electron recollision. And here I would like to, uh, to discuss a very interesting piece of work that uh, uses holography and that actually raises the question, what does holography really measure? And uh, I think this conclusion can also be um, transferred to lead. So in this first panel here, this shows um, differential measurements. So differential, um, it's not too important. Uh, this is only done for, to, to highlight the changes when one varies the alignment angle of the molecule with respect to 
the laser polarization. So that's shown here. We have here the E vector, and then we have also shown the alignment of the molecule. So this first panel here shows uh, the, the signal, uh, the measured and the calculated signal for the configuration where the electric field is perpendicular to the alignment angle of the molecule. And what we see is a symmetric distribution as one would expect. Now, if you click these Tazara, here we rotate the, uh, the alignment angle with respect to the polarization to 45 degrees, which is an unusual setup. People haven't studied this much. And what's revealed here is a really interesting off-center holographic structure. So we see all these fringes here. And the interesting part is that the maximum, the, high, the brightest fringe is not in the center, but it's offset. Now, the, uh, the interesting question is, what is the reason for that? So uh, for that, the authors did some uh, rather simple scattering simulations. In the first um, simulation, this first scenario here is um, simulated. So we have uh, a centric wave packet that scatters on this molecule that's sort of in a double slit configuration. And what we observe then in the electron, in the simulated electron spectrum is such such a fringe pattern here that reminds one of the double slit. The important part is the central fringe is in the center. Now, if we rotate the molecule and leave the wave pack at the same, the central fringe is still in the center. Uh, so this does not explain the experimental results. Now, the next step is to actually rotate uh, the, so let, let the electron wave packet impact at an angle. And here we see a small asymmetry between up and down, but still the central fringe is in the center. And now the interesting thing is if we offset the wave packet, yeah, so this, this molecule is actually oriented perpendicular now because it doesn't really matter. So there, but there's a position offset of the recolliding electron wave packet and this shifts the fringe pattern. So the conclusion is that the uh, wave packet is not hitting the molecule in the center, but rather the holographic signature uh, measures a property of the continuum electron wave packet. And so here, and yeah, that led to this conclusion that I'm sure you have all read now. So this experiment did not measure anything particularly interesting about the molecule, but rather of the electron wave packet. So it's a bit disappointing. And this of course raises the question, what's, what about lead? Um, I maybe make a comment. At this sure, point. please. So in this measurement, it's a beautiful measurement um, to get so much information about the wave packet. Now in this measurement, they performed it at 800 nanometers. So there you're very much, um, you have a lot of influence from the valence electron cloud. So if you have a emission of the electron and if you have an electron coming back, for example, in the case of lead, I know it's not happening here, but there, there you would basically have a big influence of the valence electron cloud. And so you're not really, I'm not sure this really applies to lead because you're not really abiding by the first approx uh, Born approximation where you need to have really large energies of the electron coming back, which I'll show and discuss later um, in order to have actual electron ion diffraction. So it's beautiful measurements in terms of showing the offset of the um, uh, electron wave packet. The other thing I want to say is also, let's also rem uh, take note of the energy, uh, the momentum range that these measurements were performed. And I'll refer to that later on. So it's only purely giving you information about that wave packet um, on very small um, energy scales, which are very dependent on the valence electron cloud, if we then apply this to lead later on. Okay, before, before we come to this, I would like to say one more thing on the next slide. Mm -hmm. So I... Can I say one last thing? Sorry, but oh, yeah, please, say. Please. So in terms of this model as well, um, it was performed for twice the equilibrium bond length. Um, if they perform the 2D model for the equilibrium bond length, the fringes don't actually appear here. Um, then later the authors um, did a 3D model and they showed actually with the equilibrium bond length, you do get the fringes. So in terms of this application to molecular structure, as Matthias said, um, you know, what is it? Is it one angstrom bond length, two angstrom bond length? That's really important. 
Yes, I, I think that's that's true. But I think there's also another aspect which can be learned from 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 this uh, scenario here, because the shift in position space, if one thinks about position and momentum space, the shift in position space of amplitudes corresponds to a linear phase gradient in momentum space. And this then okay, is, I think, right. an easy explanation for the scene interference pattern. So I think one can just turn this around and see every time one sees shifts of interference pattern in momentum space, one could think about maybe this is just um, Fourier transformation and leads to a shift in position space. Would you agree? Or is it not that simple? I, I think that the shifts here are so small that shouldn't affect your, um, because, you know, later I'll go on to mid infrared leak where you're looking at not eight, uh, sorry, not one atomic unit. You're looking I have at a question here for, for you guys, which this might be a stupid thing right now. Okay. What kind of system you are talking about here? Are you? Is N2 or? This is, this is N2, N2, yes. N2. Okay. And which laser field uh, wavelength you have? 800 nanometer. So here, you, I don't think it really applies to I me. Mean, yeah, it's I, true. I mean, the, I, I, you're I, completely I, right that the electron wavelength is not sufficient to resolve the position of the nuclear not. structure. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Uh, that's, that's absolutely so, true. But nevertheless, it feels the valence, uh, it feels the valence as electron cloud, and this is responsible for the scattering. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so if you allow, I'd like to say a few more things about the valence electron cloud. Namely, <laughs> uh, you don't actually need recollision to measure it. Yeah, so one, one way is to actually just use a linearly polarized laser pulse and then um, use it to tunnel ionize the molecule. And then you will, what you will measure on the photoelectron detector in the plane perpendicular to the laser polarization. <laughs> is uh, can be used to retrieve an image of the valence electron density. This was here demonstrated for uh, oxygen. And yeah, so in the next slides, I, I'd like to show you an experiment where this is done for two different orbitals of an argon ion. So here, uh, first uh, laser pulse is used to actually pump the argon ion and um, produce a coherent wave packet where now the, an electron hole oscillates between the donut shaped n equals zero orbital and, uh, sorry, the dumbbell shape and the donut shaped n equals one orbital. And now in a similar manner as here, I can uh, use a second laser pulse. The only thing is because this is a pump probe experiment, I have to do a little trick, but this is all described in this paper here. Uh, so using this trick, I can take an image of this, uh, of the valence electron density. And what's shown here is the differential measurement between the two. And you see that sort of this uh, yellow reddish thing reveals uh, the, um, well, reveals the dumbbell shape, whereas the blue areas reveal the donut shape of the n equals one orbital. And the coolest thing about it is you can actually uh, take a movie and you see, you can see the whole thing moving. Uh, so this is shown here. You see periodic revivals of either the dumbbell, uh, the dumbbell and or the donut shaped orbitals. And uh, this whole process, this whole oscillation takes about 23 femtoseconds. And it's measured here with a time resolution of a couple femtoseconds or so. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I can make a quick comment as well, just to say as well in, 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 this, in this particular work here or in any form of uh, mentioning imaging orbitals, I would be very careful because actually what you're imaging is our Dyson orbitals. So they're just projections of maybe not just one, but actually multiple uh, orbitals. So one should be really careful here just to make, uh, make yeah. sure that, that distinction. This is in terms of the interpretations. That's true. Yeah, so the, the, there's a, what, okay, but please go on. I, this is not too important. <laughs> So uh, this is where I come in and I, and I want to argue and hopefully convince you that it works. Um, so what we are doing is we're doing um, rescattering measurements. Um, so we take the electron out, we, we, scatter, we accelerate and we, we scatter the electron on the target um, with mid-infrared laser sources. So the longer the wavelength, you know that the UP scales uh, by the square of the wavelength, the larger the UP and therefore you um, can actually, um, as you rescatter, penetrate past the valence electron cloud and pinpoint the atomic cores. Um, and that we have real and uh, true and clean electron ion diffraction. There's a very nice example of what you measure. You have typically your direct electrons between zero and two UP given by this gray area. And then you have these rescattered electrons, which go all the way up to eight 
uh, atomic units. Later, I'll show you that we can go much further than that. Here, the measurements were done at two micron, approximately 2.3 micron. And what you can get is um, information about the molecular structure. Um, to, specifically, you can actually um, take into account the influence of the laser field on the molecular interference term that you actually measure. Um, so you do that basically by taking away the vector potential um, from the actual measured momenta, and that gives you the uh, momenta in the return frame of when uh, the scattering occurred. And what this gives you is this very nice um, uh, differential cross section. And what we do is we take our field address differential cross section, and we then generate from that and uh, extract field free differential cross sections, which are very, very similar to what is achieved and extracted with conventional electron diffraction using the independent atom model with um, external electron fields. So it's really uh, it's just the lead is the strong field variant of CED or ultrafast electron diffraction UED. And from this, the authors were able to show that you can extract the bond length of N2. Now, one of the powerful things about lead is that um, you can not only perform lead at low energies, um, you can actually uh, and get scattering information at different energies. You can actually look at what is the scattering angle dependence of your of your uh, of your um, elastic scattering and so therefore you can actually generate a doubly differential scattering cross section and if we contrast that to CD, CD the kinetic energies are so large typically between 20 to 100 kilo electron volt that basically uh, they can only uh, occur in the forward scattering region and so therefore you're limited to uh, just having uh, information or in terms of the molecular scattering uh, interference term um, um, in this small range. So just to give you a flavor of, of, of the advantages, disadvantages, um, and complementary aspects. So now if we go from two micron to even three micron, you can see here that we can go up to maybe even 12 atomic units. This is a case for water, a lead of a mid infrared lead of water. What you can do is you can then um, basically uh, sum uh, the electron signal at different bins. Um, you can get then this uh, kind of electron count spectrum as a function of rescattering energy. And you can clearly see you've got your direct electron region here and your rescattering plateau here. And this is where the combination of reaction microscope and coincidence imaging with mid infrared lasers is powerful because um, if you measure all your electrons, you can see the oscillatory feature here is kind of flat, it's washed out. Um, whilst if you take only electrons, uh, detected in coincidence with H2 plus, you get this oscillation uh, appearing. And this oscillation is purely from your molecular interference that we measure. And again, if we uh, uh, zoom into excuse, this area. Excuse me, Cass, I, I'm missing here the interference. Do you have something to explain about it? Yes, yeah, so you have basically, um, if you think of a double slit, you have um, your plane wave electron wave packet that's released, it's tattling back. And then what you have is um, an interference, right? It's, it's analogous to a double slit if you take the N2. Um, and in conventional electron diffraction uh, and also in lead, the molecular interference term has a um, sinusoidal term, which is sign of uh, your distance between the two atoms. And this is where your constructed and destructed interference time comes in. Yes, so yeah, I can quickly go. Between scattering of different atoms within your Yes, world. exactly. So between two pairs, so two, two, two uh, atomic okay. scattering. Exactly. So here you have these signals actually appearing, uh, modulated signals, which come from your molecular interference time, as these modulations directly detected in your electron signal with a reaction microscope. And so what you can do is you can then contrast that uh, molecular interference term signal against your background atomic terms. So that's just the incoherent sum of your atomic scatterings. And you get this molecular contrast factor, which is just the fingerprint um, of your molecular structure. And these things I just explained are used identically in uh, conventional electron diffraction. What you can do is then through a transform this, you get a uh, radial distribution and you get structure. And one can uh, say something here about the advantages of this, which is that actually uh, we can uh, see hydrogen. Our scattering amplitude is very large compared to UED or CED, the orders of magnitude lower, right? And this allowed us to uh, visualize for the first time the deep of pseudo H2 uh, dipapa 
where you have the Coulomb explosion of the hydrogen going away and the CH1 angle doubling within a, a seven, eight femtosecond time range for which the electron stack is back. So I want to just you know, raise this point because it's controversial to some extent, but uh, I think it's, you have to... Actually, I would like to weigh in about the phrase for the first time. This was done using Coulomb explosion imaging, even with angular resolution. Yes, okay, maybe I can say in terms of uh, diffraction imaging, right? Because here I'm talking about diffraction imaging. I mean, we can get into more specifics there. But, yeah. um, so here, and just focusing on diffraction imaging, I want to really um, focus on the fact that one should only perform, and the ideal conditions for lead, in the mid-infrared. Why? You have a large UP, you avoid influence of covalence electron cloud. So all this holography business, I don't think really applies so strongly, because you're abiding by the first born approximation of uh, electron diffraction. You have a large momentum transfer. This is why a lot of measurements at 800 nanometer were not able to generate um, molecular structure information. And really, really, really importantly, you're deep in the quasi-static tunneling region. This allows you to use semi-classical models to map the classical trajectories to your experimental data. Um, now, I want to also say that, you know, if you're performing near infrared measurements, it's very powerful for looking at orbital structural uh, retrieval. You're sensitive to the valence electron cloud um, and so on. So, so the, you know, depending on which conditions you have, there's real advantages for either structural retrieval in the mid infrared or orbital structural retrieval in the near infrared. Hey, so gentlemen, so you guys have shown a lot of very powerful experimental techniques where we can learn a lot about uh, electrons, electron dynamics, uh, structural information about molecules. Um, and I would like to turn to Sebastian that, if I understand correctly, you nevertheless want to question why we should do experiments at all. Yes, um, as an experimentalist, I, I was chosen to, to put a statement to, um, yeah. Um, and yeah, I think um, maybe we should, in some, some scenarios exist where maybe a TDIC has much smaller error bars and is much cleaner than doing experiments. And it might also be made way cheaper and then one can do many more, gain many more insight than just doing experiments all the time. Yeah, so, so yes, yeah. in fact, that's out of second physics right here. <laughs> so <laughs> what we do is usually putting an atom or so in an electric field of light. And so for the simplest case of the hydrogen atom that's described wonderfully by this formula here. And so I suggest what we should really do is learn how to solve this formula for more complex systems. And uh, yeah, then we, we're done with add a second physics. Uh, to give you a concrete example on the next slide. Uh, so this is uh, taken from this paper here that was recently published in Nature. So this is the, the famous actual clock applied to atomic hydrogen. And um, as you know, this is all about tunneling time. We've heard, of, uh, heard about the actual clock a lot yesterday. The point is uh, essentially you evaluate the offset angle of the photoelectron momentum distribution with respect to the laser field polarization. And now the idea is if there is a tunneling time, you uh, there should be a difference uh, or there should so oh, if there is a tunneling time, then this tunneling time should show up if you don't have a long range, but only a short range potential. And so that, that's these calculations here. And so this is using a Yukawa a potential. And as you see, there's no angular offset, meaning no tunneling time. And then in addition, they also did um, the calculation for a long range Coulomb potential. And there's an angular offset. And well, for completeness sake, I'm going to say, uh, they also did the experiment and this agrees with the calculations for, of the, for the Coulomb potential, but we already knew this because this is just atomic hydrogen. Yeah, so the conclusion was drawn from a TDSE only and the experiment is only there because, well, it needs to be. Okay, so my understanding I hope this is a bit controversial now. <laughs> <laughs> understanding is that you have two experimentalists on the panel who basically are looking for a theoretical employer right now, right? But it's easier to publish in high impact journals if you have an experiment. Uh, that's probably true. Um, okay, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> this this okay. relationship between theory and experiment. Uh, maybe we should also hear from the theoretical side. Uh, Alexis, do you want to weigh, on, weigh in on this? Yes, I will say that, uh, I mean, we so far are talking about if it is just a matter of solving the TDC or solving the, all the 
for describing the systems. I would say that in a very large system, so let's say many atomic systems of any molecular systems, we have several terms in the Hamiltonians, several degree of freedoms. For instance, you see here in that slide, a kinetic term related with uh, electrons. I let me put it my around, so there's electron part, feelings the potential, let's say, interacting with each electrons. And also you have a kinetic nuclear power, and also we have its and repulsion part between the electrons and the repulsion part between the nucleus. So in that reverse, can we show the next, uh, the next figure? And so what I can explain here is, is we have one electrons, let's say located around this row and interacting with these atoms in, of let's say, a, which atom H and F and B are and chlorine, chlorine. So I mean, that uh, it would be very, very complicated and impossible to solve that uh, showing the equation to predict what attoseconds of electron electric correlation effects in principle from the balance or deep balance uh, electrons. So I wouldn't say that TDC is a whole, wholly true nowadays, at least with our computational forces. And I think here we are just writing in a statements that uh, the solution for and what let's say the number of electrons larger than two and the numbers of let's say the nucleus larger than two is I mean almost impossible nowadays and but this doesn't mean that another alternative exists for instance DFT or TTDFT like it was introduced some years ago by Gross in his group so this is all what I have to say and then next is Cas. Cas, do you also want to express an opinion about this? Yeah, so from an yeah. experimentalist point of view, um, there is the option of doing Coulomb explosion imaging. So just taking the same molecule, the halogenated uh, methane, um, which is chiral, um, which just means that you have the inability to um, have the same 3D configuration if you rotate them into the same um, coordinate frame, let's say, what you can do is you can actually remove two or three electrons from a molecule, like for example, this one, this then leads to Coulomb repulsion um, between the charged ions, and then you have an explosion. And the direction, the velocities that they are emitted in, um, you project them onto a detector, and then you basically um, can uh, go and uh, basically you can uh, work backwards and understand where the um, atoms or ions came from. And so here, what this beautiful paper showed um, was that you can actually identify chirality just from Coulomb explosion imaging without any theory, without any reliance on uh, simulations right. directly. Uh, finally, Benjamin, do you also want to weigh in on this? Uh, we have seen from some previous slides that TDC is, uh, is, uh, is very, uh, it's very hard to solve for many electron systems. So is essentially TDC is a black box. So we start from an initial state, we shake that initial state and something happens to the state during the interaction with a laser field. And at the end we get time dependent wave function. So the question is how do we extract information from this time dependent wave function? In principle, this this wave function should contain all the information about the system and an interaction with the laser field. But we are essentially classical beings. We want to understand quantum world uh, using, uh, using tools from classical world. So uh, we are in a need of a semi-classical or classical models that help us understand the quantum world. So why we do we need that? Because semi-classical model is uh, essentially open uh, box engine where we can see every part of the engine uh, what is uh, doing. So uh, the question is, do we really need TDC since we are limited how to extract uh, information from the time dependent wave function? So why 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 can't not we do some semi classical model or just experiment? So next slide, please. Maybe I can make a quick comment. I think both have a powerful role. I mean, semi-classical really shows you the different physical processes happening. I think Sebastian will probably agree with me there as experimentalist and Matthias. But then TDSC, sometimes you need that because the approximations we make in the semi-classical model in some cases may fail. And the only way is TDSC. So, so we are using TDC on, 
just to validate experimental results. Do you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, I think that there are some examples <laughs> where, where TDSE is also, uh, is also helpful. For example, if, if one looks yeah. at a single cycle laser pulse, one wouldn't see uh, ATI peaks. So this could also be used then, for example, to test uh, certain, certain ideas. So I think TDSE is not completely useless, I, I think. <laughs> I think <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, I think as far as you can determine what are your spectra, when I'm talking about the spectra, is the age not Hamiltonian of what we showed before, and I mean, you can have information on what state that excited, what state cannot be excited, and so on. Um, I mean, this is just, of course, there are up to some uncertainty. Sebastian, are... try, to, try to publish a paper just using TDC results. <laughs> Will be tough, yeah. <laughs> especially because I'm not good at doing TDC calculations. I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's. Yeah, so maybe next should... slide. Yeah. So. You should convince me why should we ever solve TDC? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Yes. So maybe we. So just to say, this is an experiment. This, this slide has been shown before, but it would have been really striking if we saw a difference of the TDSE result in the experiment. And if this difference is maybe real, then maybe we learn something new, and maybe we discover that the TDSE is not a complete true truth, but there are some minor. Um, aspects of physics that go beyond the TDSE, for example. So I, that's not my personal opinion, but I think in general, one should ever test a theory during an experiment just to make sure one is not on the wrong track with the theory one is using. And um, another aspect is that TDSEs are also difficult sometimes because the Hamiltonian is not known exactly as we have discussed, and there can be conversions problems. Uh, so, and, and that's not the case in experiments most of the time. So. That's, uh, I'm in favor of doing experiment just to make sure that TDSE is correct. And probably I can weigh in here and I would say probably that the reality is described by classical observables. What we really measure intensity is or the absolute uh, square of the wave function, um, like for electrons, ions, photons. And you know, is there an alternative interpretation of quantum mechanics? I think here we have a poll which Mark can say something about. Yeah, so this is again where the audience is asked to uh, to weigh in. Uh, so you're giving it given a choice here of uh, uh, to choose between three statements. I don't think I have to read them out. Uh, you can you can read them uh, for yourself. Uh, but basically, it all have to do with what what we can measure in a laboratory. Uh, so if I can ask you to in a few seconds give a response, and then let's see what come back, comes back. Okay, so I hope that everybody who's going to answer has given a response right now. So let's look at the outcome. Uh, by the way, there's an anonymous uh, attendant who says, I have published papers with only TDC results. I'm sure they're really valuable uh, contributions. I, I, I do not yeah. question that. <laughs> I also yeah. have published papers. So far, yes. anonymous. Yeah. Okay, we have an interesting split. So we have people saying phases can be measured, only psi squared, psi uh, absolute value squared can be measured, um, and quantum effects can be measured directly by looking at classical observables. Is there, is there one of these three points that you guys would like to, uh, one of these three answers that you guys would like to discuss further? Gus? Uh, I mean, uh, the first answer is uh, interesting. Phases can be mentioned in the lab. I mean, typically, for example, a famous phase of the phase paper by Dieter Power and Kay Walkers, what they do is they take two fields, uh, streak them um, to look at exactly what features you have in your electron distribution. I mean, and then you. It, it might be you cannot measure directly the phase. What you can measure exactly. directly in the lab is the absolute square and by having some exactly. kind of techniques like Fourier domain, what I was explaining exactly. in the Thomas Remit experiment, you can retrieve information about the phase and so on. But this exactly. doesn't mean exactly so, that you measure absolute phase. You measure might be phase different between two different events. This exactly. is my, no, that, that was exactly my point as well, that classically, you can enter the molecular domain and get that information from the lab frame, from another phase, as we said, phase of the phase, in the lab frame to the molecular. Okay, so does the audience uh, agree with the panel here, or is there somebody who would like to voice a dissenting opinion? That's what's interesting. 
Now it looks that you have convinced the audience of your correctness. So <laughs> let's continue with the presentation then. So we have seen from previous slides uh, the key the uh, the key uh, point of this battle is how do we extract the information from um, measured momentum distribution. So how do we do it in theory then? So we solve time dependent Schrader equation and we at the end of laser uh, pulse we get time dependent wave function. So the correct way how to extract uh, momentum distribution is to use projection method. You use time dependent wave function and project it on onto continuum states. So uh, I, I have to uh, emphasize that sometimes it is very difficult to obtain continuum states and therefore there are many approximate methods that they are used for extracting photoelectron spectrum. Some of them are window operator, T-surf based method and etc. So uh, we know from quantum mechanics there are two different uh, continuum states. How do we choose a correct continuum state? This is the uh, main focus of, of my talk. So next slide, please. So we have two different continuum states. One is continuum states that obey so-called outgoing boundary condition. So this continuum state is labeled as plus. And the other continuum state is uh, obeys so-called incoming boundary condition uh, and is labeled as minus. So the main difference between these continuum states is, is, uh, is the following. So at a large distance from the atomic center, uh, a continuum state plus uh, has a plane wave and a scattering wave uh, term. So this continuum state should be used in order to describe collision experiment. But in ionization experiment, what we measure is a momentum distribution. So we measure moment, momentum. So uh, 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 the wave function that we use should be localized in momentum space. The only continuum state that is uh, localized momentum state is the uh, continuum state that we label as minus. So let's see what the difference is if we use plus and minus continuum states and put the operator together. So this plot shows the difference in spectrum, calculated spectrum, uh, that we obtained using different approaches. Uh, in general, we can see that for uh, a direction along the laser field polarization, they are, no, they are not so different, but some, so there is a slight difference between this, uh, these three calculated uh, spectra. But at the perpendicular direction, there is a essential difference between these uh, results. We see that window operator method that is well uh, known in strong field community and it, it, it is uh, often used by many researchers uh, produces a plateau-like structure that we see in perpendicular direction. But if you use correct continuum state and pro project the time to wave, fun wave function on this continuum state, we don't see that that plateau structure. So if we use incorrect continuum state, we see the same plateau struct structure. So this plateau structure is uh, due to wrong continuum state used to extracting uh, momentum distribution or photoelectric. Benjamin, yes. Benjamin, please let me understand a little bit more what you are showing here to us. For instance, you have ongoing electron wave packets, right? So let's say plane wave or ongoing continuous wave or incoming wave, right? Yep. And then you compare your calculations for the final momentum distributions with the projections on them. And you can also project on a strictly speaking the plane wave, right? Okay. Yeah, this yeah, is what right. you, you mean you mean by window operator method. Uh, okay. So Window operator is, method doesn't single out which continuous state we are using. It doesn't use continuous states. It just use plane wave, right? No, no, no. Window operator method, it doesn't use continuous state directly. You don't have to con uh, uh, calculate continuous states in order to extract a photoelectron spectra uh, using, by using window operator method. That's 
that's the essential me yes i understood i understood i understood that point that what you are doing is just masking out the ground state and projecting over plane waves directly right with window operator method this is what you mean with that no no you, you I mean what you you don't calculate plane waves in window operator method you actually yes, bending this part so okay. how, do, how what window operator method does it doesn't single out which contribution is from plus and minus continuum state. It takes both. Okay. That's why we see this in physical plateau-like structure in perpendicular direction. We don't see it in, in a correct way in, in, when we use correct uh, continuum state. So if you measure, measure momentum in your experiment, then wave function that describe that electron with that momentum should be a plane wave should be localized in 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 a in, in a momentum space the only continuum the only continuum state that is localized in momentum space is this uh minus continuum state i yeah agree so if you're using incorrect continuum state then it, it is not localized so what i me what the key point is window operator method is not the exact method. It doesn't single out uh, what, what, what is the incoming, what is the outgoing continuum state. So mm -hmm. it should be used with caution in order to describe the ionization experiment. So okay. next slide. We have, we have 10 minutes left. Okay, uh, so, so this is also visible in a full photoelectron angular distribution. So we can see that uh, there is a additional interference patterns in a momentum distribution that we that, uh, they are unphysical due to using wrong continuum state mm -hmm. in a window operator method. Mm -hmm. I agree with you because I have also so, so don't, uh, don't work with that. Directly. So when you extract a momentum distribution from time dependent wave function, you should be very careful how to do that. So you can. You can get unphysical interference pattern in, in your in your spectra, in your photoelectron spectrum. So you, you yeah. cannot then conclude, okay, you have something that looks as a quantum mechanical effect, but it comes from a wrong uh, continuum state. That's yeah. why this is uh, this, this is my statement, final statement. Approximate method used for extraction of the photoelectron spectrum from the time dependent wave function should always be checked for the consistency with the projected method. Okay, you I mean, can answer this question that I can if, I if, think if, we, if we are you, running out of time. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, there's one comment uh, that has come in. It's in relation to the previous poll that we have, uh, but uh, I think the answer is interesting and I would like to read it out to you. It's uh, it's by Andrew Brown. Um, and he says, uh, surely saying we can't measure the phase directly, but only psi square. That's really just like saying that we can't measure temperature, but we can only measure the effect that heat energy has on some known calibrated system. It's really, in that sense, it's really a question of perspective. And from our perspective, the reality might be better described by classical observables, but it doesn't change the fact that there is or could be an underlying fundamental physical reality that may be better described by a wave function. So maybe you can also post this answer to uh, uh, to the uh, Slack, I think it's called, uh, and then we might be able to discuss a little bit further. So we have a few minutes left, and I think it would be nice in these a few minutes, you guys still have a few provocative statements that you guys would like to uh, post to the audience. Yes. Uh, so uh, Kasra, maybe you can, yes. uh, it was a statement that you wanted to make about decoherence. Well, I think a few of us are interested about this question. Decoherence is a symptom um, of an incomplete measurement and has no physical reality. So we should have a poll that you guys can see. Yeah, we have three interesting answers. So if you could ask the audience to pick one. If you're not sure, then that's okay as well. Okay, let's hope that most people have made a choice. Uh, can we see the answers? So answers are still pouring in quite rapidly. Oh, so I think another in. sort of Let's 30 seconds. Wait, uh, there might be another question. No, I think you've covered both of them. 
Uh, okay. Oh, that's an interesting outcome. Yeah. Uh, would anybody like to comment on this outcome? It, it would, I, I think it would be interesting to ask the same poll again after Sebastian and I talked. <laughs> so, yes, because the point here that it, what is the meaning of decoherence and then things will go. Yes, so I, I want to present a really nice experiment by Maxim Konitsky, and um, it's an experiment where one looks at the dissociation of a neon dimer in a circular polarized strong laser field, and one detects uh, electron and ion in coincidence. And um, could you just click? Um, then the electron momentum distribution in the plane of polarization in the molecular frame just looks like this, so like a perfect donut-like uh, shape. And um, the ion... Um, from the ions, one can calculate the kinetic energy release, and this kinetic energy release then shows two um, distinct features here in the energy distribution. And um, if one now, can, because it's done in coincidence, one can now look at the individual channel separately. So if one uh, one knows from the potential energy curves that if to end up at this um, kinetic energy release, it's just this transition here. Um, and then one dissociates and it's just a direct transition and the electron escapes from uh, this orbital, which is shown here, which is the sigma gradus state. And uh, there's also this other channel and this other channel um, goes, is this an indirect transition where one moves down this potential energy curve, then one absorbs an additional photon, and then one ends up at a higher kinetic energy release. And it's really important to realize that here, the electron comes from a sigma ungradus state. And um, what is really nice is that one now can look at the electron momentum distribution measured in coincidence with this high kinetic energy release. And then one clearly so show, uh, sees this interference pattern, which is just a, a, a double slit interference because the neon dimer acts as a double slit in position space. And then in momentum space, one sees those stripes. And what is really in, uh, important to realize is that the maximum here is just in the center of this interference pattern for the sigma ungrada state. If one now looks at the other uh, ionization channel where we have the sigma gradus state, it just inverts the in, um, interference pattern and we have de uh, destructive interference at the center of the distribution. If we now sum up those two distributions, not uh, resolving the kinetic energy release, then we end up with the circular shape and we lose um, this interference information. So to say, or we, one could maybe call this interference, uh, decoherence and um, so interference is recovered, selecting only one cha channel. So uh, one could also say if one knows if this additional photon is absorbed during this in indirect transition. And therefore, I would argue that decoherence is a symptom of an incomplete measurement and has no physical reality, again, to be provocative. Hey, Matthias. Yeah, OK. And so I want to argue that some processes are, in fact, incoherent by nature, while others are coherent. So let us first. As I said clear that quantum physics is a microscopic theory. So when we're solving the TDSE, we're in a microscopic world. And of course, there everything is coherent. But when we do an experiment, we're in the macroscopic world. And here uh, in a strong field uh, experiment, we have to average over the focal volume. And this can wash out the, uh, the coherence. So we have a focal intensity distribution, a focal phase distribution, and we need to take this into account. And we do so differently depending on the process that we study. For example, in high harmonic generation, one averages over the focal volume or integrates over the focal volume by taking a coherent sum of all the contributions within the little focal volume. In ATI, however, we take an incoherent sum. So here, different atoms apparently are not emitting electrons coherently. And uh, this is my poll that I would like to ask. So while in high harmonic generation, all atoms in the focal volume radiate coherently, in ATI, electron emission from different atoms is A, as you can see there. OK, so the question to the audience. And I, I think I know the answer, but I'm not going to tell you beforehand. OK, so the question is, in ATI, is the electron emission from different atoms inherently incoherent, coherent, but we generally don't observe it, or you're not sure you're a cat? So please take a few seconds to give your answer.
So do we have a sufficient number of answers uh, that have come back? Could, could we see the answer? Interesting, <laughs> very interesting. Okay, um, yeah, sh should I say my opinion on yes, why please. I think it's incoherent? Yeah, um, because when an atom is ionized, the ion carries the same information as the electron. So you could tell where the atom is. Uh, sorry, you could tell what, at what electron comes from which atom. And this is equivalent to looking at the double slit and watching through which of the two slits the electron travels. So this erases uh, the coherence. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Okay, and Sebastian, you also wanted to say something about this? Yes, there's another really beautiful experiment um, about uh, C70 uh, molecules that are um, here at the beginning. They they come from a source, then they are diffracted at a at a at a grating. And then finally, they are detected by by a, a scanning mask, and this this setup allows one to um, now heat up here the C seventy molecules, and the heating energy can now be um, varied. So for low heating energy, um, we one sees a clear interference pattern just by shifting this this grating here and, and measuring how many um, how many molecules make it to the to the setup. And um, by moving the scanning mask, one sees this oscillation here, which just tells us that there is an interference of these C C70 molecules with itself. And if one then starts heating, the intensity increases a bit, uh, but, and if one heats further, then the modulations, they decrease, and finally, they, the modulations, they vanish. And this means that f f the heating of the molecules, so to say, destroys the coherent nature of those C70 molecules. And, um, the question is, why is this the case? So is there, are there any ideas um, from the other panelists, maybe, why this information, why is decoherent? So I think it's a, it's a black body, body radiation that can be used as a, as a which way marker. So I just give the answer now because we're running out of time. So yeah, yeah it's a nice example, I think. I think okay, thank you very much. I, I think indeed that we have to uh, slowly wind up the discussion here. I must say I'm very happy we've had a, I think we've had a very lively discussion with many different uh, uh, viewpoints. Um, I think it's also particularly interesting that, uh, I mean, the questions that you have asked the audience, uh, not one of these uh, questions has, has gotten, let's say, a clear answer where, where the audience agreed as a whole. Uh, I think this well. I think this is a good sign for our research field. That means that we still have some work to do, um, and uh, yeah, I think it's very exciting that that there are these these major issues that that we apparently still really need to uh, debate debate among ourselves. Um, so I want to thank the panelists very much for your, uh, I mean, for the hard work that you've put in uh, ahead of this uh, discussion, and also for the very lively and constructive way that you have uh, conducted uh, uh, the panel discussion. Uh, and I want to thank the audience for your attention here. A uh, small apology to Eberhard Gross and Jens Biegert, who have sent in comments uh, during the session that I have not been able to work into the discussion. Uh, but I hope that the comments that they have written, that they will show up in Slack and that they can be further discussed uh, there. Then. So I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, see you after the lunch uh, break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. You. It was missing some slides, but it's okay. <laughs>